Thomas is also well known to everyone here for his works on Hebrew language and grammar as a former director of the uh, Institute for Jewish Studies at the Hebrew University, former director of the Ben Svi Institute, uh, very great scholar of much wide interest, and among other things is working on the position of the Mushtamil that you've heard, and as uh, Miriam said, Abu Faraj is going to be one of the stars of the, uh, the show here today, and uh, please the subject will be, indeed, Abu Faraj Harun between Mushtamil and Al-Kafi, the chapter on the infinitive. Following the custom of our sages, I would like to open in a word of thanks and praise of the Ahsanya. I'm sure everyone here joins me in congratulating the Daniel Lasker, Daniel Ish Hamudot, with a warm and strong Ish Al-Koa. Thanks to his uh, initiative, his dedication, and his investment of time and energy, we gather here, friends and colleagues, in a very well planned and promising, exciting already, as Marigel said, a conference. I could have left this note to the end of my talk, but there is an, an essential reason to start with. Daniel has also shown a keen interest in the linguistic matter. <laughs> Daniel has also shown a keen interest in the linguistic matter as he addressed the linguistics here in this group with a sharp question. In one of his emails, he posed the following question. I quote, what I'm interested in is what is Karaite about Karaite grammar? And one can, uh, what can a study of Karaite grammar tell us about uh, Karaism and uh, Karaite origins, if anything? Uh, this is indeed a tough question. Putting it in actual terms, the question is, what makes Kitab al-Mushtamil or Kitab al-Kafi or Meorain Karaite grammars? Perhaps it's easier to start with a neighboring question, also linguistic. What makes Jamal al-Faz a Karai dictionary? Or Abul Faraj's biblical glossary, a Karai? Uh, it's much easier to discern Karaism in the lexicographical aspect, because lexicography by essence tends to be subjective as opposed to grammar, whose nature is more objective. In fact, Karaite lexicographers immersed their dictionaries and glossaries with Karaite interpretations. For example, the entry Totafot, Tefillin or Philacteries for Rabbinites, is related in Karaite dictionaries to preaching, and Peri Etz Hadar is literally explained fruit of splendor against the, rabbi, the Rabbinite uh, Etrog and the like. But this statement requires a restriction. That this condition is mandatory, but not sufficient, as we found such views in Mahberet Menachem ben Saruk, where he interpreted Totafot the Karaite way, and Lotev Ashel Gedi Bachalev Imo, regularly interpreted by the Rabbinites, do not boil a kid in its mother's milk, as if it were related Gedi to Megadim, choice fruits, an opinion that indirectly supports the permission of cooking meat with milk. Um, what is then a sufficient condition? That the author himself be a Karaite, thus a dictionary composed by a Karaite, and where Karaite beliefs and opinions and traditional biblical interpretation are incorporated will be considered Karaite. But what can exactly be Karaite in a grammatical method? What is Karaite in the uh, symbols method, or method of symbols of the verb in inflection? Is the alternative method using Gizra and Binyan conjugation necessarily Rabbinite? Is Saadia's grammar less Rabbinite only because he hasn't met those basic concepts of Gizra and Binyan? 
or is a particular syntax necessarily Karaite or Rabbinite? Uh, is anything agreed upon by, the, by both Karaites and Rabbinites is ostensibly neutral, while anything controversial should be either Karaite or Rabbinite? Are there no internal disputes among the Rabbinites themselves and among the Karaites themselves in all spheres of thought and halakha? Back to syntax. Had not both Karaites and Rabbinites uh, adopt the Arabic matrix for syntax and artificially applied it to biblical Hebrew concept? Does this make medieval Hebrew syntax Muslim or Arab? If we go on generalizing this question to other fields of knowledge, we may ask, is a Jewish physicist turns his theory into Jewish physics? Is Einstein's theory of relativity a Jewish physics? Is the chemi chemistry of Lavoisier a French chemistry? Did structuralism as a scientific method not immediately become universal? Why then expect a grammar written by a Karaite to be Karaite rather than universal, or at least Hebrew or Jewish? A particular grammatical method can develop in a cultural settings and community and might remain forever the property of that community <coughs> and even be associated with it. The method of symbols, for instance, will remain forever associated with the name of Abul Faraj Harun and the Karaites, since it was confined to them both as a theory and a practice. But then we realize that even the adherence to a particular grammatical tradition may be dependent on time and place. For example, the 13th century Byzantine Yehuda Hadassi abandoned Karaite grammar in his Eshkola Kofer and adopted the Spanish grammatical method. Uh, and so did Aharon ben Ilya of Nicomedia in his commentary on the Torah and, and others. So probably the answer to Daniel's first question is unfortunately negative. In principle, there's nothing Karaite in a Karaite grammar, except that it was written by a Karaite, or that it discusses issues developed in a Karaite settings. Accidentally, however, a Karaite matter of thought, belief, or halakha may be inserted into the grammatical discussion, yet grammars regularly remain irrelevant to religion or culture. For example, if a grammarian discusses the verse, you shall, you shall uh, uh, kindle, uh, uh, kindle no fire throughout your dwellings, etc., for any grammatical reason, um, and in passing interpret it as according to the Karait halakha, we would naturally identify it as Karait. But it's exactly in grammar where no specific example is essential in principle, unless it represents a unique pattern, morphological or syntactic. Daniel's second question is, is a different matter. What can we learn from Karait grammar on Karaism and its sources. If this cannot be directly drawn from grammars and grammatical methods, it may be learned from circumstantial matters. First of all, the very fact that these grammars, whether scientific or pedagogical, were composed by Karaites proves that the Karaites made vigorous efforts to study, teach, and transmit the Bible through the philological method uh, the Pshat method, yeah, with a detailed grammatical, syntactic, and etymological analysis, as they believe this is the only way to understand the true intent of the prophets and God's word in general, as Marichal already uh, said earlier. This was the way to inherently formulate relevant books of commandments, namely the series, uh, practical mitzvot, the series of practical mitzvot in the Karaite faith. Needless to say, this principle also applies to rabbinites and to other streams, Jewish or other. Karaite grammars may sporadically teach on Karaism and its sources, but this is a different topic. Let me turn now to the topic of my talk. 
As is well known, Abu al-Faraj was the author of biblical Hebrew grammar books. First, he composed the, the comprehensive work, Al-Kitab al-Mujtamil, Ala al-Usul al-Fusul fi al ibraniya um, Then, a shorter version entitled Al-Kitab al-Kafi fi al al ibraniya Abu al-Faraj is not just another grammarian. He was the grammarian par excellence of the Karaites as much as David ben Abraham al-Fasi was before him the lexicographer par excellence of the Karaites. Abu al-Faraj was so much identified with, with Hebrew grammar that he was nick, nicknamed in the West, in Andalus, uh, the Jerusalemite uh, grammarian, Hamdakdek Hayrushalmi. Interestingly, both Abu al-Faraj and al-Fasi bothered to make abbreviated editions out of their initial extensive uh, compositions. The focus here is on Abu al-Faraj's grammatical project, on which an intriguing question is, how does the latter version, al-Kafi, relate to the former one, Mushtami? Uh, I have already begun to answer this question in a review published recently in JQR, on the exemplary edition of Kitab al Kafi by Jeffrey Khan, Maria Angeles Gallego, who are with, here, uh, with, us, uh, with us here, and uh, Judith uh, Schlanger, who is now. The editors have already touched in their introduction to Al Kafi upon this question and pointed out some important differences. Here I would like to review this question, focusing on part two of Mushtamil dealing with the masdar and the ismil fair, that is the infinitive and the verbal noun, compared with the corresponding chapter in Al-Kafi 2.16. Um, a detailed study may contribute some interesting points. Let's begin with some notes on the general features of the two compositions. Mushtamil contains seven large parts, followed by an eighth part relatively short appended to the book after its official closing in a colophon at the end of part seven. al Kafi is only composed of two major parts in which many issues were incorporated that have already been discussed uh, as independent parts in Mushtami. Uh, Abul Faraj's uh, linguistic theory is the same in both Mushtami and al Kafi. He did not write Al-Kafi from scratch, but rather used the model he developed in Mushtami. Both works were also written in the same style, using the Taqsim classification method uh, and the same rhetoric for which reason Al-Kafi is not as concise and economical as it could have been. For instance, the content of Mushtami part three, where the grammar is presented in a, in a mnemonic way following the Hebrew letters of the alphabet is well presented in the same structure in the cafe, though not as an independent part, but rather embedded in part one, chapters 24, 28. Having been shortened to half its original uh, uh, size in Mushtamil, this section is still extremely large, consisting in the cafe of over 27,000 words and taken up uh, about a quarter of the entire book, I mean, al Kafi. Many grammatical rules dealing with morphemes consisting of more than one servant letter, uh, or chimush, are repeated in different sections for the sake of formality, because they are discussed in each of their composing letters. Had al Kafi been, been redacted differently, or had the rhetoric and dialectical style at least been avoided, it would have been much smaller in scope. Hence, al Kafi's literary uh, structure is not different from that of Mushtami. The abridgment was merely achieved either by omitting entire sections, as it's the case of Mushtami parts 7 and 8, or by el uh, eliminating examples and remote discussions. Other parts of Mushtami are represented as well in al Kafi, though not as independent sections. For example, Mushtamil part six, presenting the paradigms of the verb halakh 
is embedded in, concise, in a concise way in El Kafi 2, 9, 3 to 5. <coughs> As to the question dis discussed here, the topic of the infinitive and verbal noun, which required, due to its size, an independent part in Mushtamil, that is part 2, is embedded in El Kafi, uh, part 2, chapter 16. All the remains of Mushtamil, not including part 8, amount to about 186,000 words. Compared to El Kafi, which includes approximately uh, 110,000 uh, uh, words, we don't know exactly how much is missing of the original text of Mushtamil, but we may assume that it didn't exceed double the size of El Kafi. Yet the chapter on infinitive and verbal noun in El Kafi consists of one third only of the equivalent original size of Mushtamil Part Two, due to the omission of a large amount of chapters and paragraphs from the original version of this part in Mushtamil. Presenting the same linguistic theory in both works, one can hardly expect any new material to be in El Kafi. Yet there are some additional paragraphs in El Kafi on the infinitive and verbal noun that didn't appear in Mushtami. These paragraphs are not completing anything that Abul Faraj uh, felt to be missing in Mushtami. They rather constitute another layer of the subject, more sophisticated, of the type of the uh, philo philosophy of language. Abul Faraj himself says that he corrected in El Kafi errors which occurred in Mushtamil and that he has shortened or expanded as needed. Here is his own words with Hans rendering. Take note that in the final section on the infinitive in part two of Mushtamil, I argue, argued that the letter mem and also the letters expressing the future form of the verb could be attached to infinitives that have the same form as imperatives, such as daber, daber, medaber, ledaber. I subsequently, however, formed the opinion while composing the current remarks on mem that what I have just stated is preferable, namely that this letter cannot be attached to, the, uh, to uh, an infinitive. But who can discern his errors? Clear me from uh, uh, hidden faults. Shigiot miyavim ministerot lakini. From this and other parts of the work, one may learn, as stated by the editors, that this is not a pure abridgment, but a summary in which many changes have occurred by shortening, extending, and changing the, organi the organization of the material in such a way that reflects the development of the author's grammatical thought. The editors also noted that even the compendia that followed El Kafi, Al Muhtasa, and Kitab al Uqud include innovations that didn't appear even in El Kafi, as shown by the comparison with the fragments that survived and uh, from some notes that appeared in the introduction to Kitab al Uqud. As to our chapter 16, dealing with the infinitive in El Kafi, Abul Faraj says explicitly in the introduction uh, that he will shorten and at the same time he will add to uh, what he has wrote in Mushtamil. In Khan's translation it goes as follows. Take note that I have included in Mushtamil an extended discussion on infinitives with full explanations. This included an indication of all the categories of infinitive in their numerous types and classes and an account of what is related to them. So that this, this discussion, on account of its extended nature, occupied a separate part of the book. The average version, however, cannot treat this, the topic in this way, for it's not feasible. He doesn't explain why it's not feasible. Rather, my intention is to discuss only the essential features without neglecting the, to mention any unusual aspects that are worthy of note or to make some additions to what I stated there uh, that I have occurred to me in the meantime with the help of the exalted one. 
Yeah, this is uh, only a general comment. As noted, the editors of uh, Al-Kafi have already formulated in general terms the fundamental difference between Al-Kafi and Mushtamil, saying that Al-Kafi is not just a simple summation of Mushtamil, but uh, it rather includes material that didn't appear in Mushtamil. A systematic comparison of Mushtamil Part 2 with the corresponding chapter in Al-Kafi proves this statement to be an understatement. For the gap between these two accounts of the same topic, the infinitive and the verbal noun, is very big. On the one hand, Abu Faraj omitted in Al-Kafi many generalizations and details that appeared in, that appeared in Mushtamil, and on the other hand, he has extended in Al-Kafi matters that were not discussed in Mushtamil at all. Basic matters appear, of course, in Kafi too, uh, such as the definition of the infinitive according to the etymological sense of the term masdar, a place from which a thing is issued. The word's pattern of masdar denotes place, as much as maktab, office, indicates a, a, a place where people write down, mahbas, a prison, where, where prisoners are prisoned, a mahraj, and the mahraj al ma, spring water, a place where from water is coming out. Hence, the term master denotes in the first place a place where various forms are inflected. al al-ladi yatasarrafu fihi tasarrufan mukhtalifa. The following rules were also discussed in Al-Kafi. The infinitive exists virtually even if it, it's not documented in the Bible because, I quote, a verb cannot exist without being preceded by an infinitive form. For uh, uh, if it were otherwise, the form would not be called masdar, but rather sadr, that is, departing from the verb. Um, the infinitive may automatically be used as an internal object which, uh, uh, with each verb. In Abu Faraj terms, again, and this is, this time uh, this is from Mushtamil, the inner object al-maf'ul al-mutlaq, is the infinitive. The infinitive may be used by itself, and as such, it replaces the predicate, which is the missing verb. Uh, then, the conjoined verb is not mentioned explicitly, but is rather estimated, such as zahor at Yom HaShabbat, remember the Sabbath day, or Shamor et Chodesh Aviv, save the new spring, which uh, should be understood as Zahor Tizkor, Shamor Tishmor. The infinitive should not be inflected in plural and doesn't take an adjective or an attribute. It goes without saying that al Kafi complements things that exist, uh, existed in Mushtamil but were lost due to the bad preservation of the manuscripts. For example, in Mushtamil, chapter 17, that deals with letters that may be attached to the infinitive, Abu faraj referred to chapter 3 that dealt with the explanation of the four infinitive types. A, the imperative. B, the past. C, al-masadir al-munassafa. D, other types. But whose explanation didn't survive in Mushtamil due to the loss of one leaf from chapter 3? The term al-masadir al-munassafa was unclear to me, and in my uh, article on the infinitive, I assumed it had to do with verbs that have different infinitive forms, such as hashev, reply, as an in infinitive absolute, and lehashiv, to reply, as an infinitive construct. Al-Kafi easily fills this gap. The term denotes infinitive forms composed of two halves. The first half is vocalized according to the imperative pattern, whereas the second according to the past pattern. For instance, the first half of le hashiv, hashiv, follows the vocalization of the first syllable of the imperative hashev, okay, reply, and its second part, shiv, the shiv, right, is modeled on the final uh, syllable of the past form, heshiv. Uh, this is, of course, reminiscent of the symbols method. But quite a few rules and many details brought in Mushtamil are missing from Al-Kafi. 
uh, 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 here are a few examples. Mushtamil 2.6, whose character is pedagogical, uh, is completely missing from al kafi Pedagogical here doesn't mean it was meant for the student, but rather to the teacher. And as I noted in the review referred, uh, referred to above, the very fact that al kafi is an abridgment of Mushtamil makes it neither a more practical or elementary grammar, nor even a handbook. It's still a reference book for scholars who, have, uh, who are well-versed in Biblical Hebrew. Enough to mention that Abul Faraj's presentation of the linguistic material is not graded. From the very beginning of the book, the reader is assumed to know a great deal of grammar and syntax. For instance, in a preliminary chapter on syntax, Abul Faraj anticipates morphological paradigms and uses Biblical verses as examples. He also uses technical terms long before he defines them, as is the case for the term mabni, structural, and racket, affixed, which he defines for the first time in uh, chapter 27 of uh, part 1 of al kafi even though he used them without any definition many times in earlier paragraphs. Back to Mushtamil 2.6 whose title is The Forms of the Infinitive and of Nouns that are similar of the infinit to the Infinitive, including verbal nouns and nouns of every root, and the differentiation of the Infinitive from the noun, including the denotation of gender, masculine or, and feminine, of nouns similar to the Infinitive. This is a very long time. Abul Faraj presented in this chapter about 60 entries arranged in an alphabetical order as in a grammatical glossary. In each entry, he presented six grammatical forms and commented whether it was an infinitive, a noun of action, or just a noun. For the most part, he also explained his assertions in a schematic, mechanical, and didactic way, which gives this chapter a distinct didactical practical character. Here is one out of uh, the 60 examples. Title, Amor, Omer, Emer, Imra, and Ma'amar. Amor is an infinitive because it applies to verbs. That is, this is the form that entitles the verb, or perhaps it's the form that may conjoin the finite verb. Omer is a masculine uh, a noun of action because it lacks the infinitive mark, uh, uh, marks, uh, uh, markers, and it may be inflec inflected in plural. Omarim. Uh, Emer is also a masculine noun of action and is not an infinitive because we found it in plural, as it says, Amarim Emet, sense of truth. Imra is the feminine noun um, for saying and is not an infinitive for what is mentioned above, uh, uh, for, wa uh, for what is mentioned above, and because it appears as a construct form with the uh, tav, imrat Hashem Tzerufa. Uh, and this is not allowed in the infinitive according to the late Abi Yaqub, the wise. Ma'amar is a noun of action, like Ma'amar Esther, the command of Esther. So, end of quote. Similarly, chapters 3 to 9, 11 and 13, where uh, many topics are discussed in detail, such as the morphology of the infinitive, its configuration patterns, the fine tuning of the settings for the differentiation between the infinitive and the other forms, the morphologi morphological relations between the infinitive and the finite form conjoined to it, uh, conjoined to it etc and between the infinitive and other morphological categories such as the participle, all of these are entirely missing from al kafi including more than 700 biblical examples that Abul Faraj needed for his various patterns, infinitives, nouns of actions, or absolute nouns. To give just one example, the rule that says that the passive forms have their own infinitive, such as hoshkev, belayed, 
for reda v'hoshkeva et arelim in Ezekiel 32. Or hochret, out of hochret, hochrat mincha in Yoel, and gunov gunavti, to be stolen. All this is missing from El Kafi. Chapter 15, which was dedicated to Hebrew Arabic comparison of the infinitive and the verbal noun, is completely missing from El Kafi, uh, uh, chapter 16. The fact that Abul Faraj decided to drop the pragmatic and training aspects of Mushtamil is probably due to the fact that he felt confident that the reader would draw the missing details of, uh, out of the uh, generalizations. At any rate, he managed this way to dramatically reduce the scope of this topic. At the same time, he added new insight on various aspects of the infinitive which have nothing to do with descriptive, pragmatic, or normative grammar, but rather are dialectic and philosophical, sometimes semantic, and once even theological, such as sections 2, 16, three to chapters, or paragraphs 3 to 5. Right on the opening of the chapter on infinitive, as if it were a declaration of an intent. These new discussions are certainly not meant for beginners or even advanced students, as they are very theoretical. A relatively simple example can be his discussion of the question, why should the infinitive rather than the imperative be assumed as the form underlying the inflection? Here he puts great effort to convince the reader, as this goes not only against the Karaite traditional grammar, but against his own pragmatic method as well. Here are two out of four arguments in Hans' translation. Uh, those who have espoused this view among the Arab grammarians and the Kufans are the Kufans, uh, and among the Dikduk scholars, a group of Iraqis. A number of things demonstrate the falsity of the statement of the two parties. These proofs include the fact that the imperative is one of the parts of the verb on account of the existence uh, in it of the defining feature of the verb. That is, the fact that it contains meaning and a reference to time, just as this is found in the past and the future forms. If this is so, why should the imperative be the base of the inflection of the verb rather than the past of, of, uh, or uh, uh, of future forms, since it doesn't have any superiority over these two forms in this matter. Moreover, it would follow from this that the imperative is the base for its own inflection, since it is one of the parts of the verb. The falsity of this is so clear that any further discussion concerning it is unnecessary. However, it gives four proofs. <laughs> Another proof is as follows. It has been established above that the imperative is one of the parts of the verb. The people of the language cannot utter a verb without having previously used the base from which it's derived, since this base must be the more primitive form. This is because having conceived the idea of the base, circumstances require, that, uh, require them to establish a noun to name it. After that, they derive from it the parts of the verb that is the imperative, the past and the future. Surely you see that when they were hungry, as we people maybe now, uh, and then became conscious of the passing of their <coughs> hunger, uh, they uh, partook a when they partook of food, they named the idea that they conceived eating. Then they give commands to one another with forms that they derive from this. So one said to another, eat this. Then when the, uh, the one who was commanded ob obeyed the instruction of the one giving the command, he reported, by this, uh, 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 reported this by saying, he has eaten. He also reported the occurrence of the idea in the, in, in the present or the future saying, Behold, he is eating at the moment, 
and tomorrow he will eat and derive it, uh, from it and now saying he is an eater. All this indicates the improbability of the opinion of those who hold that the imperative is the base of inflection. It's the infinitive that is of necessary to the inflectional base. All this discussion didn't appear in Mushtamil. The same holds true for uh, paragraph 216.21, where he poses the question why in some cases the infinitive alone is used without a finite verb, whereas in others the finite form is, is used without resorting to the infinitive form. Because of these gaps, dilemmas arise sometimes. For instance, in my article on the infinitive and the verbal noun uh, mentioned above, I assume that Abu Faraj probably realized that Arabic has no equivalent of the biblical Hebrew infinitive absolute. I'm now uh, uncertain whether this assumption is still valid because in Al Kafi, he says that darb is master, whereas darbatun is a verbal noun. And this is the same distinction he makes in Hebrew between the infinitive and the verbal noun. The question is probably more complicated because the same opposition, darb and darbatun, is uh, uttered in Mushtamil in such a way that he contradicts what is what it's said in al kafi But this needs more reviewing. To sum up, although kafi is more compact, it's less pedagogical, and more theoretical. It raises questions of philosophy of grammar, and um, it does seem to be a concise version of Mushtamil, but more like another, it doesn't seem to be a, 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 a concise version of Mushtamil, but more like another layer above it. Thank you very much. We have about five minutes for questions, comments? Well, so I think uh, the answer to your question you raised in the introduction to, the, to your presentation is very easy. Uh, is there any um, K-right drama, of course, if uh, there is uh, Judeo Arabic? So there must be also uh, Judea Arabic grammar, not only uh, lexical. I think a uh, better solution would be Carrillo <laughs> mm -hmm. Arabic, but it, it is reserved for uh, Turkic. Okay, right. This, uh, it was uh, proposed by Wexler in his uh, classical uh, article. His, uh, can write a Jewish language. But uh, of course, there are also some extra linguistic aspects, of course, of, of this question. But uh, what is much more complicated to what you hinted in your presentation is uh, uh, applicability of our uh, terms like. Uh, infinitives of verbal nouns to uh, Semitic uh, phenomena like Mazda I don't know if it is <laughs> uh, what an infinitive is in general so just thought you wanted to go back to the first part of your presentation where you discussed how Karait is Karait grammar. Um, and you said that there's nothing Karait about Karait grammar. But I just wanted to give maybe a slightly different direction to this saying no, there's nothing Karait. If you say Karait is what is Karait Bahalacha, then there's nothing Karait about Karait grammar. But Karaism is not only halakha, it's also tradition and culture. And if the first grammar of written by a Karait was not perhaps particularly Karait other than by 
other than being written by the Karaite, the rest of them, I would say, are Karaites because they are within this tradition and they draw on the sources and it's a sort of a closed system where they say grammar doesn't travel. For a long time, Karaite grammar didn't cross the boundary of being written by Karaites and by drawing, drawing on the sources by the Karaites so that when you see a Karaite grammatical work, uh, you recognize it as a Karaite grammatical work if you know other works. So I would say um, grammatical works written by Karaites are specifically Karaites because of how deeply rooted they are in the tradition. And in this sense, it seems to me that Abu Faraj, the Karaite grammarian, is the least Karaite grammarian. <laughs> yeah, because he doesn't tell He is the greatest grammarian, but at least how I know him from Al Kafi, he is the least rooted in the tradition. He draws the list of the tradition, and the tradition that comes after him, uh, even when they say they abridge, uh, these are abridgment of his works, they are more rooted in the oldest tradition. I'll come back to this in my talk. But he is or almost an outsider to the Karaite grammatical tradition. So I would say there is things Karaite about the Karaite tradition and this is being within the tradition and not drawing on other grammatical ideas developed by other groups of grammarians. I just have to follow on to that. I mean, with Nadia that really, again, I go back to this point about um, the fact that the whole question of character grammar has to take into account that it's developed in distinct phases. And as Nadia says, I mean, Abul Faraj is a great intellectual figure, but he was very unique. And I would say that, you know, what is really characteristic of Karaite grammatical tradition is that before Abul Faraj, it was a discipline, the, the kind of the, the grammatical type of activity was in a discipline which was different from anything that happened in Rabbanite grammar, starting from Sadia. Basically, Sadia's work was grammar as we know it, the discipline, but the previous grammatical activity, pre Abul Faraj, Karai grammatical activity, was not. The discipline of grammar, as we know it, it was a rather different discipline. It was, I mean, this is what we'll talk about on Thursday. I mean, it was associated more with Masora, and it was so. I think there was a disciplinary boundary here, and I think so. Um, so I think you know there is some uh, validity in the, you know in, in saying that. Uh, but I just, just, just quickly, I, I just like to. I mean, I, I think you know it's very. It's very good, you've, you've made this very detailed sort of comparison and I think something which only you could have done, you know, being so closely involved with the Stammel and the, and I think it's very, I've learned a lot from that. I just wondered though in general, I've often, you know, I've often thought, you know, what, you know, because we have a number of examples of these, these fun, the, the phenomenon of a longer text being shortened, you know, this is a very common phenomenon across the Middle Ages. But, um, you know, when, you know, when we were doing the edition of Look Carefree and, and, you know, we, I, we saw that this was almost like an excuse for sort of expansion and, and further creativity. I, I often ask myself the question, you know, what exactly was the, the motivation for this uh, shortening? I mean, you immediately think, well, okay, just to make, I mean, he says in the introduction that it, it's the idea is to make it more accessible, but I, I don't know, I, I often think there's more to it than that. I mean, there's a sort of almost like, um, is it really simply a way of, um, uh, uh, I mean, what is the context? I mean, is, he, is, is, this, is this being done for, for whom? For whom is this being done? I mean, is this being done for the sort of classroom situation or for, um, is, this be, is it because it's commissioned? Sometimes there's references to people commissioning works, particularly sort of, sometimes there's references, introductions to people, people requested these, a short version of it. Uh, I think you know, taking into account the sort of the 
the sort of the motivation behind these the, sort of these shortenings and what uh, these epitomies and what, what what was the actual really context, the setting, and the, uh, I think it's uh, an interesting point. Uh, you just let Aaron a couple of minutes, maybe the share a few announcements. No, Miriam wants uh, to say much. I know Miriam, yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. No, I'd also continuing on what Jeffrey said about um, uh, epitomes, because it's interesting when um, it's fascinating what you point out about the kafi pretty much being an extension of Abu Farah Sharun's. You know, and it's not just a shortening, like you said, it's a further development. And it's interesting because I've been, um, I'm going to speak later today about the introduction to Abu Fartoun's glossary. And there, um, he, he makes it very clear that he's included some grammatical discussions in the glossary, even though it's not their place, because it's not for grammar, because he, he has more things to say, and he has more developments. And also, it's interesting when you when you look at an, another abbreviation that he made, which was his abbreviation of his teacher's Bible commentary. There, it's very clear. It is an abbreviation in terms of um, length, uh, word count, but he, he added very many things, and he added um, many grammatical concepts that contradicted his teacher's work. So it's interesting, he did have, it, he certainly, I mean, I think as many other authors in the period, he didn't have the concept that an abbreviation had to be an abbreviation. An abbreviation or an abridgment is an adaptation, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.